good evening. We're continuing our series on Wednesday night titled Learning to Pray Together. And this evening I'd like to turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 18 and we'll look at verses 9 through 14. Luke chapter 18 verses 9 through 14. And the title of the message is Contrasting Dispositions in Prayer. Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down, this man rather went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. So I want us to see in this text that the objective for both men is the same. Uh, they go to the temple and their objective is to pray, to reach God. And yet the dispositions that both men have are completely different. You've got a self-righteous man and he prays within himself. God is not involved in this prayer effort. And so he's not reaching God. But then you have a humble man who sees his need for mercy, and he won't even lift his eyes toward heaven, but he pleads for that mercy. His heart bleeds for it. And he gets the mercy that he wishes from the Lord. One goes away from the house of God justified, and the other doesn't. And so let's think about the dispositions of both men this evening. First of all, you have the Pharisee. And you have to ask, well, what in this text characterizes the Pharisees' disposition or approach to God in prayer? Well, I think three elements are present. Uh, you have pride, first of all, right? When you're so full of yourself, you forget how empty you actually are. And that's what we see with the Pharisee, hot air. You know, hot air is a great metaphor for the Pharisee because he's so full of this hot air, in other words, he's puffed up with nothing, uh, and yet he thinks that he is full. The Pharisees uh, were that way. This Pharisee was thankful, but he was thankful for himself and for his self-righteousness. He was not thankful uh, for God or for his mercy. He didn't think he needed God's mercy. He spoke well of himself. He gave himself a eulogy while he was still alive. And... Um, he spoke so well of himself that he didn't see his need for God. He, he didn't commit sins in his mind. So, uh, you know, for him, uh, he, he, he didn't struggle with sin. He was blind to it. He, he was deceived. All right? And so his daily disposition before God was a disposition of pride. And God finds this to be an abomination, of course. Whenever we're proud, our hearts are far from God. Another element to the Pharisee's approach or disposition is his lovelessness. If I can put it that way, I don't even know if that's a word. But he had a, a lovelessness about him. Uh, anyone who commends himself is usually very busy condemning others. And so we certainly see that with the Pharisee. He, he condemns a man that he doesn't really even know. Uh, and he takes the position that only God has as judge. And so the Pharisee is judging the tax collector in our text. And so uh, when he does this, uh, we see a man that delights himself in criticizing others. And when he does that, he's looking at life from a martyr's perspective. I mean, whenever we see our, ourselves as so righteous and everyone else is beneath us, uh, we feel like we're living this sacrificial life, that we're doing great things for God, but we're sacrificing and nobody else is coming along with us. And we have this view of people 
that, that, that says to them, you're just not living up to my expectations of you, so you're not really even worthy of my time. And really, that's how the Pharisees came across. People needed the religious information that the Pharisees had, uh, but they have forgotten mercy and sacrifice and serving, and so they, they really couldn't communicate all of the good information that they had because of the pride and lovelessness that was in them. So the Pharisee didn't love the tax collector. That's the bottom line. And we know this because he doesn't pray for him. Instead, he criticizes him. He, he does hate him. We know this because he hates him enough to condemn him. Look at this man, Lord, trying to approach you. It's not love at all. Uh, we, we really have to be a people that, that seeks restoration and, and peace and strength within our fellowship. We want, we're only as strong as our weakest link, so we have to look at the weaknesses that are around us and try to help people, pray for them, and approach them and try to bring them up in their relationship with God. Build them up, not tear them down by criticizing them. And then the third element in the Pharisee is self-dependence. I mean, if you really see this prayer, you have to ask the question, what sins does the Pharisee confess to God? Well, there are none, because he doesn't see any sin in his life. I haven't committed any sin, so what, why would I confess it? And yet we know that that's delusive. He, he, he doesn't confess sins, but he takes time in his prayer to God to describe how virtuous he is. Now, if it's true prayer, it's always preceded by this idea, Lord, I don't deserve what I'm asking for, but I pray that you would grant it to me anyway because of your mercy. I pray that you'd forgive me. I, I see sin in my life. I, I don't want it there. I want to forsake it. That's a Christian praying. Uh, we, we, we have to spend some... Well, You've got to ask yourself this question. How much time do you spend confessing sin to God in your personal prayer life? And then I'll kind of give you a good idea of where you're at. And uh, obviously we should be confessing sin every day. So he trusted in himself that he was righteous. He, he was self-dependent. He was self-righteous. That's the uh, Pharisee's disposition before God. But then you've got the uh, tax collector, and you have to ask yourself, well, what characterizes a tax collector's approach to prayer? Uh, what's his disposition like in it's the exact opposite of that of the Pharisees, right? First, we see humility, not pride in, in the tax collector. You know, the Pharisee, he's lifting up his hands toward heaven, and he's expecting to receive something that he deserves because of his righteous list of virtues. But the tax collector, he doesn't lift up his hands expecting to receive. Uh, he won't even look up toward heaven because he has this keen sense of shame. Uh, about him. He understands his own sinfulness and he's not worthy to approach God. He's so bothered by his sin that the text tells us that he beat upon his breast as he called out for mercy. That's humility. He understands that he doesn't deserve it. He's pleading for mercy. His heart is bleeding for mercy. Secondly, I, I think we see that he is heartbroken in the text. Because you have to ask the question, what causes all of this anguish in the tax collector? And the answer to that is, it's the way that he had treated others. It's the way that he had lived his life. He had taken advantage of his own people. We know the background of tax collectors. And, and so in order to get ahead himself and to have material wealth himself, he abuses people around him. And so he, he knows that he's not deserving. He knows that he's sinful. He would view himself as the chief of sinners even as Paul did, and worthy of all condemnation that God would direct toward him. And instead he pleads for mercy from God, and his heart is broken and contrite before God. The third element in this man is not a sense of self-righteousness, but a dependence upon the righteousness of God to justify him. He is depending upon God. Now, why does he depend upon God? Where do I get that from the text? Well, he depends upon God because... He understands what so many of us fail to understand about ourselves. We need God's daily mercy. And that's the lesson. Now, if we're going to learn to pray together and, and be powerful in our prayer effort together, we're going to learn to need God's mercy each and every day. 
He knows that there is nothing in and of himself that is worthy uh, to offer to God. All human hope in his life is lost. He is the dregs. He's hit rock bottom. And that's a great disposition. <laughs> you say, well, why is that a great disposition? Because God delights in people who hit rock bottom, who are broken and contrite of heart, because they have this disposition where they can seek God and his throne of grace and receive great power. So those are the dispositions of both the Pharisee and the tax collector. And so the Pharisee goes away from the place of prayer and he's not right with God. I, I'm convinced that sometimes we go away from our prayer meetings and we're not right with God. And he, he is not justified. That's what it means to be right with God to be justified, to put, be put right with God. But, but the tax collector is right with God when he leaves the house of prayer. He is justified. You say, well, what's the bottom line difference? Well, Jesus tells us at the end here. Those who exalt themselves like the Pharisee, they are going to be humbled. But, but those who humble themselves like the tax collector, they're going to be exalted. And all of this takes place in the place of prayer. And so, do you want God to lift you up when you pray? Then have the disposition of the tax collector. In other words, have the right disposition. Longing, pleading, bleeding heart for the mercy of God. Let me just finish by really looking at this text and applying it to our lives. Are, are we trusting in ourselves? That's the first question that I'd like to contemplate this evening. Are, are we trusting in ourselves when we should be trusting in the Lord. When, when someone points out sin in our lives, do we do what the Pharisee did and, and give them a list of our virtues or say something like, well, at least I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Well, is there wisdom in us when we compare ourselves among ourselves? Doesn't the Bible say that that's not wise at all? When we commend ourselves among ourselves, when we compare ourselves among ourselves, we are not wise people. We're doing something that's really foolish. Proverbs 28, verse 13 says, He who covers his sin will not prosper. Um, and, 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 uh, but whoever, the good part about this is, whoever confesses and forsakes sins, all right, will have mercy. If you will confess and forsake sin, you will have mercy from God. If we say that we have no sin, John tells us, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, verses 8 and 9. So, uh, are you trusting in yourself? Do you, have you come to the place where you just don't spend a whole lot of time confessing sin because you've been deluded into thinking that you're living the perfect life or something? Or that you're better than most people? So God is pleased with you. Secondly, are you harsh and loveless when it comes to your uh, plight uh, with other sinners? At least you view it as this plight. Uh, you speak of all of your own virtues and, and you condemn others who don't meet your expectations in life. How? They're not here to meet your expectations, right? They're here to meet God's expectations. And if they're not meeting God's expectations then you should go to bat for those people and pray for them, not against them. You sh certainly shouldn't complain about them. Uh, that's what the, the Bible is teaching us here. So it's really conceited and arrogant to condemn others, uh, especially when we're praying. A as we've been learning in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, um, you are still carnal. That's what he tells us. Verse 3, he says, for there, where there are... Uh, envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Even though the Holy Spirit indwells you, you're behaving like a mere man, as if you don't have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. You are behaving in a carnal fashion. So those who understand their own sin will have a more loving disposition uh, toward others who are struggling in their sin. And that's the way that it should be. And that kind of atmosphere will be really good in a local church. Third, are you depressed about the sin in your life? Okay, that, that's an important question to ask because I think that the tax collector could have been at that place where he was just in despair. 
and depressed about his sin? Are you struggling to even look toward heaven for the mercy of God? Well, if you are, then you've never been in a greater position to pray. Don't be afraid. Come boldly before God in his throne of grace and, and trust in the mercy that he wants to bestow upon you because you are broken and contrite before him. He will not despise you. He will not look down upon your call for mercy. He will give it. Uh, go, to, go to sleep tonight after we're done praying, but, but go to sleep justified, right? Don't go to sleep still carrying this burden of, of self-righteousness and still pointing the finger at other people. I think that's the lesson for tonight. What, what would Jesus say to you tonight if you have cried out earnestly for mercy? Well, I, I think I know what he would say. He, he would say you have it. And you would go to sleep knowing that you're justified. Perhaps he would say what he said to the woman who anointed Jesus' head and washed his feet in the presence of Simon, another Pharisee. This is found in Luke 7 and verse 48. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. They're gone. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Well, that's what will save you tonight. <laughs> Your faith has saved you. Uh, go in peace. If you will express faith tonight by asking God to cleanse you from your sin, to forgive you for the unrighteousness in your own life, for, for the taking advantage of the people around you, or for the behavior like a Pharisee, if you will do that earnestly, God will hear your prayer. And um, he will come into your life and bring spiritual healing. Maybe that's what you need emotionally, too. Maybe that's why you're struggling even physically. A lot of the things that we struggle with spiritually affect us mentally and physically, too. I trust that you will be in good standing before the Lord tonight and that he will give you good sleep. He loves you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to meet on a Wednesday evening and, and to pray to you. We, we have a sin, Lord, there's no doubt about it, every day. And some of it is really subtle and we miss it. Now, it's, it's really wonderful that you have made it so we don't have to enumerate all of our sinful activity before you each day. And that we don't even have to wait until the end of the day to confess sin. But as you bring things to mind, help us, Lord, to acknowledge these life-dominating traits that are bringing us in a negative direction. And if there is pride in us, if there is this idea of arrogance and lovelessness, if, if we're struggling with self-righteousness, Lord, please, please forgive us and gently nudge us toward a direction where we are humble and heartbroken and uh, eager to serve and to receive healing. Father, I, I ask that you would help all of us together to be in a good place to pray as we learn not just to pray together, but to pray as families and as individuals. Uh, Lord, we are needy right now. We have great needs for our general fund, great needs for our missions efforts, great needs for the school next year and we just live in a very unstable time please provide for us uh, please keep folks safe in our church provide for their daily needs help them to rest well to exercise or give what is needed financially to those that are in our church if there's anyone hurting help us to meet needs the best that we can we pray for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We will see you uh, on Sunday. God bless you. If you have any needs at all, go ahead and give me a call. I'm always here for you. God bless you.